clarify the situation and draw out the outlines of a global war between two paradigms uh, going on. Between the new paradigm that ends the old order of geopolitics, of, of proxy wars, of military conquest, economic conquest. And I want to do this from the standpoint of unfolding real time. Everything is connected to this war. Everything. Including the recent agreement of the U.S. and Mexico with Canada on trade, replacing NAFTA called the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, Trade Agreement. Even that is part of the war. And uh, I'll go in later to how that works. Now, the next major inflection point in this war, huge inflection point, will come in one, exactly one month in the outcome of the U.S. midterm elections. So, why are the midterm U.S. elections the, uh, the key inflection point in the current period in this war? Well, we can partly see this first in the following way. What is the campaign, election campaign about? What does it become? Is it about economics? Is it about foreign policy? Is it about more giving you a tax cut, giving you more taxes? What, what is it about? What, what is the main issue of this midterm election? Well, Generally, in midterm elections, each candidate has their own issues tailored to the local, you know, the local profile of the population. But that's not what's going on. The main overriding issue in this election, as put forward in the media, and it's put forward in the parties, is the removal of Donald Trump. That's the issue in this election. The removal of Donald Trump. There is no other issue of fundamentally close to the importance of that issue. So why is that the issue? Uh, well, if you listen carefully, to Donald Trump's UN address, he supports a return to no global governance. Uh, no global governance. Every nation is sovereign. Every national culture has a right to determine its future, provided it doesn't uh, interfere with the other the other cultures. He, 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 he put the emphasis on science, scientific progress. He attacked, um, he's not going for, for an environmental or, or, um, um, straitjacket over nations. His speech had very many similarities to a win-win, there's a win-win sort of quality to it. But it was based not on a global concept, but on the concept of each per, each nation first, each nation each nation's first, but not in the struggle of the survival mode, but in the struggle, but rather in a cooperative mode. So this was highly praised by this aspect of the speech was highly praised by Zakharova, the the uh, the woman who is the uh, spokesperson for the for the foreign ministry of Russia. But who really believes that? He really meant that. Right? I mean, how can you possibly believe he really meant that when you look at the ground, when you look at what's going on, when you look at the, all of the, the things that are happening? You know, the U.S. is moving with very provocative 
uh, exercises in, in, in Eastern Europe and in, and in, uh, and in, the, in the Scandinavia. There's provocations everywhere. There's sanctions. The U.S. is sanctioning all these Russians. It's sanctioning uh, trade with Russia. Okay? And you have the U.S. forces building up in, uh, in, the, in, in the Mediterranean. The next, you have U.S. forces engaged in direct combat with, with, with uh, Syrian forces at, very, at various locations. And you have Trump saying that, that the Russians and the Syrians should take out the terrorists, but do it gently, do it, you know, surgically. But then you have the U.S. supporting those terrorists. And then you have Turkey involved. So what's going on? So how can he possibly be, be telling you the truth if the, the actual actions of the United States go totally against um, that, those principles? The same on trade, right? Um, and we'll get into the trade question a little bit later because that becomes very, very significant. Uh, okay, so so how do you reconcile this, this this paradox? He's the president. He was elected by the American people by the, or the Electoral College. He's the president. How do you how do you uh, deal with this? But then the campaign, the, the issue in the campaign is removing Donald Trump. Would that be the issue if Trump was a fraud or just another scumbag out for himself, just like all the other scumbags, or just has a different way of? A different version of trying to keep the empire together. The people here in this room are Canadians. They live in Canada. They look at the United States from the Canadian perspective. The U.S. has not been very good to Canada. It's been an oppressor. So Trump's probably just the same old, same old, I mean, continuation of what the U.S. has been doing to Canada, if not worse. And then you talk about, yeah, the U.S. is supporting the genocide in Yemen, being run by the Saudis. Well, we've heard Trump say a few things that that shouldn't be going on, but it's happening. And he's the president. And then there are other things of that type. But then still, why is removing Trump the only issue in the midterm elections? Why is that, would that be the case? Now, here's where it gets real. There was an article that Kevin sent me from Political, which was written saying, look, you guys, it's Trump that is the resistance to the U.S. government. Not the U.S. government, which is the resistance to Trump. And this article is not favorable to Trump. This article wanted Trump out. But, but the article was explaining something that's different. From, from the, or not different, but it was being posed in a different way, which is the, the government of the United States has been chugging along with these policies for some time. And Trump is the resistance to those policies. Not the other way around. The government is not the resistance to Trump. That's what was basically the point that was being made in this article. So, where is this going? The reality is that Trump is barely hanging on. He is not in charge. He's only the president. His vice president, Michael Pence, is right now far more in charge of U.S. policy than Donald Trump. And it's 
And as things stand now, Michael Pence could, if not most likely, become the next president of the United States. May God help us. Huh? May God help us. And he would probably be the last president of the United States. Now, Michael Pence, the vice president, just gave a speech at a place called the Hudson Institute, where he was attacking China. The head of the research at Hudson Institute is a well-known figure by the name of Scooter Libby, who was formerly the chief of staff of Vice President Dick Cheney. And he was convicted of leaking the identity of a CIA agent, covert CIA agent, Valerie Plain, as a, as a way of trying to force CIA uh, uh, individuals in the CIA to, to comply with the demand that Dick Cheney had made to them of pro providing fake evidence of Iraq weapons of mass destruction. Some of you were around back then and you probably remember this. Okay. So that's the guy who has the research part. The guy who has the China research part at the Hudson Institute is Dr. Michael Pillsbury, who has a new book out, China's 100-Year Marathon to Rule the World. In other words, the Chinese are thinking way ahead and they're going to take over. And that's the issue. Now, who is Michael Pillsbury? Michael Pillsbury was very much involved in the Afghan uh, and, the, and, and that whole uh, nurturing of, 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 of those characters. Michael Pillsbury was 40 years ago, 45 years ago as a matter of fact, was uh, involved in a project to interface with the, the military of, of, of China in the policy of turning China against the Soviet Union or at, at, at during the mid middle of the Cultural Revolution or, or, or more than further. And he was meeting with uh, PLA uh, uh, officials and was involved in organizing the transfer of, high, high, of military technology to China to, to, so that they can, conf they can have something to better in order to deal with the, the Soviets. This guy is right now advising Vice President Pence. He's very close to Pence. And Trump mentioned him in the speech. We are targeting Dr. Michael Pillsbury, exposing him, because He's probably having more influence on China policy than, than anyone else right now. Now, the original founder of the Hudson Institute back in 1961 was the notorious, obese Herman Kahn, uh, Mega Death Kahn as we used to call him, who popularized thinking the unthinkable. <coughs> that is winning a nuclear war or using the escalation towards a nuclear war but staying be below the nuclear war in order to obtain uh, concessions. Unfortunately, it is vice presidents in the United States, especially in the recent period, who played a key role in either undermining or actually running things for this empire, for the British. Ronald Reagan had George Bush. <laughs> and when Ronald Reagan was shot, the Bush crowd was able to move in. Because they were with the establishment, Ronald Reagan was the outsider. Bill Clinton had Al Gore. Clinton, again, was an outsider, relative outsider. Al Gore was the inside man. And W. George W. Bush had Dick Cheney. 
I wouldn't call W. Bush an outsider, we would just say a, a non-sider. Uh, <laughs> and Dick Cheney was essentially the governor. That's essentially what you see today, in part. Although Trump is resisting this. So, this is what we're up against. Now, the Kavanaugh hearings, which occurred, he, he, has, been, uh, he has been appointed. I mean, he is, he is on the Supreme Court now. But that's as of today. But the point is, that's not the point. The point isn't that he made it through. The point is that people watch these hearings. And it was... It was, was, it, was, um, it was very strange for people. It was very bizarre. It was very shocking. The behavior and the way it was handled and the way the Democrats ran this thing. And I'm not going to claim a victory or, or a backlash on it, although there is a backlash going on, because this is... And I agree with Pat Buchanan on this. This is a, an example in the small of what is coming if the Democrats take the Congress. You have key Democrats calling for violence against Trump support. <coughs> in public places, or protesting, or whatever. This is totally weird. It doesn't make any sense. You're not going to gain friends and influence people by doing that. You're not going to win the affections of the American people by talking like that. You might get a few people riled up, but why are they saying this? Why are they doing this? Oh, they're desperate, they're psychotic, they're, they're um, you know, etc. Well, I, don't, I think there's more to it than that. And I could be, and I'm going stepping out on my own here. They're laying the groundwork of the mood and temperament and circumstance for what they're going to do if they take the Congress. Okay, and real clear politics, which is which assembles all the polls, says that the situation, and I don't trust them, and I'm not saying it's going to happen. But the situation that they're claiming is that it will, it's headed towards a democratic takeover of both the Senate and the House. So this is a foretaste of what is coming. Do you think Donald Trump could survive that kind of thing in the context of having a, a consolidated uh, government behind Michael Pence. I don't think so. Something similar happened to Bill Clinton during the period where he was having a, a stroke of independence from the system, uh, when he was considering LaRouche's uh, a, a New Bretton Woods. And when he, there were a lot more people in the institutions that, that were open to, um, you know, to those ideas. That was exactly 20 years ago. And what happened is they had an operation run through Gore on the inside and Newt Gingrich and the Republicans on the outside and they had a special prosecutor uh, Kenneth Starr, and they did this whole thing with Monica Lewinsky and the crime, and, and Clinton did get impeached, but they tried to force his re Clinton's resignation, and he almost did. And Al Gore would have been president. And Al Gore and, 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 and uh, Mike Pence are the same thing. Well, so, So what these guys will do once they're in, they'll just keep going. They'll find this, they'll find that, they'll find this, they'll just, just keep it going. And uh, 
If Trump doesn't resign, they'll find, you know, it'll just continue. The country will be paralyzed, and whoever's, whoever's running things will run things, and it won't be Donald Trump. It'll be whoever's running things. The people are running things right now, which is headed towards war. So, that's what we face. Could something like that lead to an internal civil war? Maybe. Could it lead to an increase of military action, sanctions, and other things like that leading to war? It, it, yes. Take this woman, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who was 20 years a senator uh, from Texas. She went on to later become the ambassador to, the NATO, uh, to NATO. And she made some comments that really, that really, you know, caught people's attention. You might say they turned their heads. She said that Russians have developed a new missile that's a violation of the Intermediate Range Treaty, which is, is another one of those things that, you know, you can make claims and it gets all, you know, no it isn't, yes it is, you know, you're, you're, you're violating it, no, you're violating it, that kind of thing. And then she said that the United States reserves the right to preventively um, target those uh, missiles inside Russia. And everybody's going, huh? And later she took it back, but, but, wait a second. What's going on here? No, this is just a warning of what is to come. As Willie Wimmer, Helmut Kohl's former, uh, he's the former Chancellor of Germany, Deputy Defense Minister, once Deputy Defense said, Trump is currently the only thing standing in the way of nuclear war. Now, an escalation in that is going on. And it's continuing to go on. And the only way for it to stop is for the U.S. and Russia, for the President of the United States, the President of Russia, to sit down and come to a whole series of agreements which are then imposed upon the government of the United States. Okay, that's the only way to stop it. And that's what Trump seems to be trying to do. However, the Russia gate is not about any collusion because there never was any collusion. It's about this preventing that possibility. Now, uh, something interesting I'm going to go through real quick here. Um, give me a second here. Pull it up. Okay. Earlier this week, there was a, I think it was 11-minute interview, maybe longer, uh, on One Nation uh, 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 program. A One Nation program with Keisha One, Rogers. One America. One, huh? One America Network. One America Network. I'm sorry, One America Network. And um, the One America Network had, uh, we didn't know at the time, but the Keisha was on, but the one in there had a reception and, in Washington, and um, we, 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 we had a significant discussion with Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul. And at the reception in Washington Wednesday uh, evening, we presented Rand Paul with the idea uh, that the, of the Schiller Institute's new bread and wood petition said that, and he said that he thinks it extremely difficult to envision Putin or Xi acting with Trump to create a new monetary system because they are constantly finding new U.S. sanctions directed against them. Quote, they are being forced to try to run away from the dollar and cooperate against the United States, he said. A bill with new sanctions comes across my desk at least once a week. More than that. And then, uh, and then uh, that's a quote. And a motion that he put forward in the Senate Foreign uh, Relations Committee to have a legislative meeting with Russian parliamentarians was voted down 20 to 1, including by half a dozen people who told me privately it was a good idea. 
Paul said these kinds of working relationships were essential to American national security and peace. He said that he thought the U.S. sanctions pressure could not, as with Korea, lead to an agreement on a credit trade system, but would lead instead to a real confrontation and anti-U.S. monetary moves. Rand Paul, however, acknowledged that Italy could play a mediating role. Italy. So that Italy is positioned as a government to, 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 be, the, to be the mediator. So So all of this assault on and the election is totally coordinated between the financial system, the media, the Democratic Party leadership, the Justice Department, etc. Uh, it's that serious. That is why the U.S. midterm election is not a U.S. event. It is a Canadian event. It is a Chinese event, it is a European event, it is a world event. One key factor that could influence the result of this election is whether Trump will actually declassify key documents that we've discussed before. Uh, it will reveal, among other things, the British role so why is revealing the British role so important? Why is it so important? Because it will disrupt in real time the coordinating center. The coordinating center that's coordinating the media, the Justice Department, etc., 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 is not coming from the Justice Department. It's not coming from the media. It's not coming from the Democratic Party. It's not coming from the intelligence community. It's coming from one coordinating center, which is in, in the British system. It's the British intelligence. It, it's not coming, it's coming, it's, it is, this, and that system is centered in the financial, offshore financial system. So, so if you expose their role, you damage to some degree the ability to coordinate this whole thing. Because half the time the people being coordinated don't even know who's coordinating. Okay, now, uh, hold on one second. Yeah, I gotta get, I gotta get that. Um, where's my briefcase? Oh, there it is. Okay, one second. Sorry, I forgot something. Okay. So now I come to something very significant, and that is the speech that. Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, gave at the United Nations. You had Trump's speech, then later you had Macron's speech, and then you had Rouhani, the president of Iran's speech. And this is uh, related to an article that was written by, uh, by Thierry Maison in something called Rousseau Voltaire. So some of what I'm saying is uh, reported by him. I actually listened to Lavrov's uh, speech this morning, but basically, um, you had Trump's presentation about disrupting the, about ending the global governance, and then you had this weird sort of sophistical argument by the president of France, Macron, essentially attacking Trump because Trump was destroying the international order on which. The good things that have happened and happened and the good things that need to happen can only occur through that international order. So, so Macron essentially attacked Trump's attack on, on the New World Order, on globalization. And then Rouhani's approach was to say that Trump is no longer pretending to respect international law. Well, does he mean he's no longer respecting the structure uh, of global governance or, or the structure of the sovereignty of nations. What's, 
So, so but Rouhani is still attacking him, saying that the U.S. is just doing whatever they want. Now, so when Lavrov spoke, he 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 basically said, "Look, well, I'm not going to discuss this from this standpoint. I'm going to go deeper." He went deeper, and he he basically addressed the entire West, saying that the policies you are following do not work. What you are trying to do doesn't work. The wars you have carried out don't work. A global new a new system is emerging. The SEO, the BRICS, you know, the Eurasian, uh, the, the Lamb, you know, etc. He's saying a new system is emerging, right? And it's not your, what you're doing won't work. And the problem is you're trying to continue the same old system. You're trying, and he did it in a very diplomatic uh, sort of way. You're trying to continue the old, same old system that doesn't work, which is the colonial, the continuation of the European colonial system, right? I mean, basically. So, and then he, he makes a very sharp reference. I'm doing a meeting. I'll call you later. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what La but Lara makes a very sharp reference, saying that the Russians and Westerners have a very different interpretation of Munich. The, the Westerners all talk about who, who, who dropped the ball, who made the mistake on Hitler, this Chamberlain or whatever. And the Russians say no, collectively, the West lost, did not, you know, are responsible for what, for allowing Hitler to, to, to be able to um, do what he did. Right? And so, so essentially, LeBron is not targeting Trump. He's targeting the entire Western elites. He's targeting the entire saying, you guys, this is a failure. And by saying this in that venue, he said it in very diplomatic terms, but this, well, not, in saying it in this venue, he puts this on the table in the entire United Nations. That that's the reality. That was, I, I, that's new. That's relatively new. And that this pursuit of democracy was a fraud. All these regime changes and everything else was a total fraud. It is imposing all these things. So he, he called the spade a spade in front of God and everyone, including the United Nations. <coughs> so, so that's a very interesting development. So now, we, are, we have the stage set for the ongoing battle between the two paradigms. For a long, long time, the Belt and Road, no, uh, you know, you didn't hear anything about it in the media. It was sort of, you know, God, why is nobody talking about it? Why is there such a media blackout? You know, this is really great. This is going to develop the world. It's going to end poverty. All these wonderful things. Only if people would know that that's what's going to, that that's what it represents. Now it's being covered. Chinese imperialism on the march. <laughs> yeah, it's being covered all right. And what is the emerging response of the West that that is under, that is, that is within the old paradigm, what is their response to the Belt and Road? Well, we'll get to that now. Okay. Okay, there's a guy by the name of Gordon Sondland. He is the U.S. ambassador to the European Union. And he was speaking to a small group of journalists. And he said that the real benefits of an American trade deal with the European Union would be its threat to China. 
He called his call subvert. Sunderland called uh, It subverts Trump's public efforts to encourage more sovereign governments in Europe. It attacks the existing bilateral agreements in nations in Europe with China's Belt and Road Initiative. So you got a lot of European nations that are already well are, are into bilateral agreements. And this is a quote from him: "The jackpot in concluding a trade deal." is having what is about 40 trillion combined GDP working as a block in terms of dealing with China, Chinese growth. China theft of intellectual property, Chinese malign activity, Chinese militarization in the South China Sea, and all the other things we've been calling out to China to stop doing. I think when we have our act together, we can act as one voice and that's a very powerful voice. He said, America is willing to do a wide open deal with the European Union, trade deal. No tariffs, no barriers, no subsidies, wide open on both sides. But that means no cherry picking either. He, however, doubted the European Union's political will to do so. There are too many industries that have fences built around them, he said. He said, if you decide you want to sell an important business to the Chinese, he said, you should go into that decision with your own eyes open. So he goes into how, you know, anyhow, he, he, this is the ambassador to the European Union. Now where else did something like this occur? The United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreement had a provision in it, okay, and uh, it was uh, it was the following. And I'll read you from that provision. It's Article 32.10, non-market, FTA. At least three months prior to commencing negotiations, a party shall inform the other parties of its intention to commerce free trade agreement negotiations with a non-market country. For purposes of this article, a non-market country is a country that, that on the date of signature of this agreement, meaning the USMCA, at least one party has determined that a non-market economy for purposes of its trade remedy laws and its country with which no party has a free trade agreement. Upon request, the party shall provide as much information as possible regarding the objectives of those negotiations. So basically, they're talking about China. So if Canada wants to have a free trade agreement with China, Canada has to notify the United States and Mexico and has to go through the whole thing. And if they sign the agreement and the U.S. and Mexico decide they, didn't, they don't like that agreement, they have the right to leave the treaty. USMCA. Yeah, to leave the USMCA. So how is that for? Uh, uh, this, the Chinese have, have attacked it, and it is a poison pill. And people are talking about who set this up inside the Trump administration. I think it's Navarro is, is the guy. They're talking about putting this poison pill in every trade deal that they work out with, with uh, Japan or with uh, any, any trade deal. It's not going to work. You can't stop the Belt and Road. The momentum of the Belt and Road is beyond, beyond 
Sape. Okay. So, so, then we have, all of a sudden, something new has come up. And this is, this is really amazing. Okay. And this is, um, where is this? Anyhow, um, let's see if I can find it. Okay, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. The U.S. Congress just passed a bill and Trump is signing, which sets up a infrastructure bank. Not for the United States. Not for Canada either. For $60 billion to compete with the Belt and Road. So they're willing to have an infrastructure bank to build infrastructure in to, to try to sway people out, sway countries out of the Belt and Road, but not for the American people. Don't tell me they don't know about Hamilton. Don't tell me they don't know about infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure bank. So uh, now this whole this whole approach is going to further split the European Union. Okay, and um, the government of Italy and its president Conti has had very good discussions with Donald Trump. And they have offered to be the mediator with Iran. Trump has been very friendly to Italy because the government is very friendly to Trump. This government is going all out to join the Belt and Road and become a direct partner with the Belt and Road with China. and also in the joint development of Africa. Now, Italy is the second largest industrial power in Europe next to Germany. The person spearheading this is the deputy, is the undersecretary for economic development, Michel Garacci, and he spoke at our conference at one point, or he sent in, so we know this guy. He's running this. And the popularity of the Italian government is going up. They have done something that has really freaked out the European Union. They're supposed to, to be reducing their debt because of the, the fight, you know, they have too much debt. But they decided not to do that. They decided to increase their debt by a certain percentage. And everybody's freaking out. They are, they are committed to the sovereignty of Italy. So you have, you have this battle of occurring. And Italy is a key, is now a key player. And, and we're, our little group there is talking to all these people. We're, we're close to all these people. And they are serious. Now, the two economic systems we're talking about are not compatible. These policies, as Rand, Rand Paul says, are driving these countries to find other means to finance their activities and to conduct trade. There is no solution unless there's a global solution. And the global solution has to be what we've been fighting for for a long time, which is a new architecture, a new fixing shape system. That's the only way. Until that happens, this, we will have further trade disintegration, further trade wars, and further, further, further uh, disintegration. Um, depending on the outcome of the midterm elections, that 
potential may increase or decrease, or decrease radically. So that's the trade economic warfare going on. And the further economic warfare is going on because the United States' is, uh, Federal Reserve is raising the interest rates and causing a reverse uh, a, a flow of funds out of the emerging markets. It's causing a crisis in the emerging markets. And all the companies in Indonesia and Turkey and you know, all these other countries are under uh, uh, so forth. Then we come to the military and the South China Sea confrontation. And there's a lot going on in Europe. There's a lot going on with Ukraine. Ukraine just got uh, Abram tanks, I believe. Uh, so that situation is heating up. But then we come to a major nation. that's been balancing itself perfectly between these two systems. Guess what nation that is? India. India. You got it. And that nation, to that nation, Vladimir Putin paid a visit for two days. And the result of that visit, which did not come just with him, it was not just a diplomatic visit, there was a large contingent of Russian businessmen that came with Putin. And they agreed, the, the uh, Indians agreed that, hey, you know, how about some S-400s? And Putin said, sure. So they, they signed an agreement for some S-400s, and the U.S. is going, what? But are they going to sanction India over buying S-400s? What if India decides they didn't like, they don't like being sanctioned. <laughs> right? So, and then what about Iran? Iran, that, that in November, anybody trading with Iran, the sanctions will kick in. But that's after the elections. What if India continues to, to trade with Iran? It's a major trading partner with Iran. They get a lot of oil from Iran. Is the U.S. going to impose sanctions on India? That's a big country. And there's a lot of Indians in the United States, too. And in Canada. And in Britain. So, so what else happened? Well, they, they discussed laying the groundwork for India to become to establish a free trade agreement. There's another free trade agreement we're talking about with the Eurasian Economic Union. And you got a country with a billion point one, one point one billion people establishing a free trade agreement with, with an area which maybe has at most 300 million people. That's very nice. And then the Indians get all, this, all, all the Russian technology, all the science, and of course, the Russians get all of the advanced uh, IT stuff. And the Russians are talking about dramatically increasing the trade between India and Russia. And the, the Russians are, are planning to upgrade 500 kilometers of Indian rail and get very active in developing uh, the nuclear power capabilities of India and also a north-south corridor. So, this is a war. This is a battle over two fundamental systems. And we are heading into a major inflection point in the United States. And I'm very active in that, um, uh, personally. Um, according to real, clear politics, um, there are three districts in Washington State that could flip. And our little, small, little group of people up in Seattle have decided that we have some responsibility there. So we're targeting the two weakest ones. Actually, the weakest one. We're targeting the weakest one, which is um, where we're sending most of our uh, people into to organize that area. Um, now, to further elaborate on uh, this agreement that was made with Canada, the, um, it appears
appears that where Canada and the U.S. are concerned, the investor state resolution has been ended. Chapter 11 of the NAFTA Treaty is not being carried over into the new, new agreement. The other thing is that it appears that the energy proportionality where, the United, where Canada has to sell at below market price to the U.S. a percentage of its energy production has also been scrapped. Canada is free to uh, not to do that. They don't need it anymore. <laughs> they don't need it anymore, right, exactly. And uh, uh, so, and the third thing, um, and then there's, there's issues, uh, no property right, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the whole issue of, um, it, of IT, well, internet, um, and, and, and the whole issue of, is not resolved, and, and the issue of intellectual property is not, is not resolved. And the pharmaceutical situation is that the patents are going to be extended longer, so Canada won't be able to produce those medicines. And so we come to the, to the Canadian uh, political situation, which we discussed a little bit in the promo before. Um, in fact, Phil discussed it at the last meeting. Um, and there's elections coming probably next summer. And then you have, you have uh, um, uh, I'll leave it at that and open it up. Supposed to be enough, Bill. Okay. That's why I just read it the same way.